I will. Sorry about that, brothers and sisters. Um, I had to make some more room. The recording device. But what we were saying about Egypt, we're making a comparison here in this um, 13th sabbatical portion known as Shemot. And um, here, this is this is the 13th RSS number 13, Shemot in the Hebrew. And Shemot, Bamarin, and Namharic is known as the names from the Hebraic perspective. Now, it's called Exodus or Orit Zetzat or the Torah, the Orit of coming out. And then we know the relationship is with Egypt. Now we say that this is an initiation. So the first two parts of this series was on the initiation. And what we mean by initiation, this is the beginning, you understand, of Exodus, the book of Exodus. But in this particular time frame, seeing that Friday the 13th with the beginning of this 13th sabbatical portion in the year 2012 we think is to say the least interesting you understand and perhaps there's much more that's related with that as well but we wanted to just point it out and to go on the record with that now we went through the Schofield uh, reference Bible the introduction part to understand that this is about this is the book of redemption Redemption means buy a buyback, a sense, but really return. Like repatriation means the return to Abba, the return to Father. Now we know that Christ is the real coming out. Zed He is the real coming out. You understand? Coming out of the, the curse and into the blessing. Coming out of the false mind state and into his consciousness, his way of thinking. You understand? Learning to not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, to be in the world, but not of the world. Now, we was mentioning about Egypt, how people look at America. People say, well, America, we like the, um, we like the, we like the, the people and the music and the entertainment, the movies, but we don't like the Americans. I mean, we don't like the American government. So when they say when they say down for America, they're not really thinking about so much the average people, the average so-called Joe and Jane. They are more thinking about the government and the policies, but they say they like the people. Some of them might even want to come to America, but still don't like the government. So how are they able to look at America in a sense with that particular, um, some could say a split screen in a sense? It's the same way we need to understand this book of uh, Shemot, which is known as the Hebrew book, you understand, of Exodus, the Hebrew book. And this is volume two. This is our study companion here. And we just read briefly in the previous portion from here. And we didn't even get into the part about where they sought to um, um, kill the Beta Israel children. And this is similar to some policies that are going on here in America since the time and probably before that, but especially during the time of COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program, you understand, which has been connected with the running of drugs into the ghetto neighborhoods, as well as guns and other things to foment a kind of uh, um, black on black uh, degeneration and disintegration because they were under a fear back in the 60s of the rise of a black messiah. Now, this is all very much connected now when we're looking at this book of Exodus. This is why we're saying that this particular portion, which is the first portion from chapter 1 to chapter 6, verse 1, is very important. It's crucial to really get a groundation in this 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 area of scripture i think it's especially significant for us as once lost but now found black people in particular to really get grounded in this book that's what we say this is a this is a key towards um a prerequisite in a sense of um of sustainable repatriation of sustainable repatriation i know there's much um concern and, and talk and meditation on coming out of Babylon, you understand, of coming out of pe people, they vibe, you know, have spiritual, 
you know, vision and, and understand what time it is to some extent, but we have to become more mature. You know, in that fullness of it, therefore, to become studied in the Word. The Scriptures is very important. Christ teaches us this throughout the Gospels. You understand know, how important it is. By every time he says, it is written. So we must learn to read what is written and also to, um, to, to, to uh, keep it in our heart, you know, like to learn it by heart, to keep it in our memory. You understand? And even seek to, when we study the scriptures, to try to memorize. You understand? Let that be an exercise as we are upon different aspects and different sort of works that we are also about. Um, now, that aspect about how Egypt is looked at, right? How Egypt was looked at from, from ancient times should be understood in the same, in the same relationship as people look at America today. But there was an affliction. So Egypt, we, said, we were saying, was like D.C. You know what I'm saying? We'll keep this on the board for probably this portion of the lesson, but we'll clear this when we hopefully can go into another aspect of this. But just take some of this down, and we'll probably go over this. And those who are able to, you know, be creative and can take, say, the audio or seek to use visual demonstration of this and would like to do that sort of work, in helping to um, bless the ministry and increase, you understand, the, the reach, you understand, of the good news of his imperial majesty, and his Christ, Jesus Christos, our black Lord and Savior. Please feel free to do so and just contact us about that and, you know, try a thing and let us check out what's, you know, what's going on, all right? Um, but the second aspect of this now is what Pharaoh did. Now, we say Pharaoh should be understood as the White House in this prophetic time. And it's interesting because the whole 1960s and Dr. King, we have a, a DVD, an, another DVD that just came out, something. It's kind of a long DVD. It's nearly five hours. But this DVD is concerning um, MLK. And it's MLK, I Had a White Girl's Dream. Now people are like, what? MLK, I Had a White Girl's Dream? The alternative title is Dream a Lie. You understand? It's actually, like you say, two programs, you understand, or two, two kind of documentaries, or two main subject matters that we put in one. One is dream a lie, and it's talking about the whole dream thing, how that statement, that whole idea was not really King's message. Wasn't, the King had many important messages, but the only thing that lives is this dream thing that has gotten co-opted and corrupted. And this is a part of this bondage that we are under right now as the once lost but now found data Israel in this present time. So now Egypt in that sense would be like D.C., like when the movement went down and it was that march, they went down to D.C. You see, at that very same time and based on our most recent history, black people were thinking and beginning to think more globally. But there was an attempt to keep us in Egypt and under these taskmasters. And, and there was a new kind of order, a, a so-called political sort of order. And this is kind of where we're at right now as black people um, presently. So it says that um, Joseph and all of his generation had died. So it's almost a precursor to what happens in the wilderness on another level. We see how when another, a new generation comes along, there's another generation that's coming along as we are a different generation than our parents and as our children and the children's children will be different generations from us. We can see through history how dramatic generation change can be. We see so in Ethiopia. It's very clear if you take a look at um, what happened with another generation that came about in Ethiopia. They're known as the careless generation and what they did and the consequences that even present generations that wasn't even born then still are going through because of what the previous generation has done. So we must understand the role of generations. If we look at the system, the Gentile world system, they, 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 they study these things under sociology or, you know, various different subject matters, but still they understand the importance of this. So the scripture is giving us a template 
you know, uh, uh, insight uh, into the template, the structure of this, um, as well as a recurring objective lesson. So a new pharaoh arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He didn't know Joseph. That's uh, another very interesting aspect. And like we said, there's different ways of studying these subject matters. Like if you could study it on a level, in a sense, what they would call mythologically, that will add a certain gnosis or knowledge that is then able to give a better a density and definition to the picture that you're able to see, as well as to certain things that may be prophetic as well. But the overview, just a general overview, is now showing us that they went down to Egypt, right, because there was a famine. There was what? There was a famine. Where was the famine? It was in the promised land. So here we have an example that there can be a famine even in the promised land. So we hear about a famine in Ethiopia. That does not make Ethiopia not our promised land. Or in Africa, it doesn't make it not our promised land. Oh, this is what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, because even the Bible shows us and the Scripture shows us that there were famines even in the promised land. And the people, instead of abiding through that, they went down into Egypt, and then after a certain period of time, they got, you know, they got rich, they got wealthy, but then there was a political shift, and not just a political shift, but a religious shift. Of course, they did not know Joseph or this new king, this new pharaoh, a new government. Because remember, it's not just one man. One man is representative, but it's a whole government. It's like we say the White House says. Though it may be President Barack Obama, we say the White House says. You know, the White House or somebody from the White House. So it could be an individual, but they're speaking on behalf of their own or Pharaoh or the White House and that to, to understand how this goes. So when we see Pharaoh here, we should not always think it's just an individual. See, that's where a lot of misinterpretation when people are reading it, they think it's just one person that's saying it. In some senses it is, but a more diligent study of this, you begin to see some of the historical aspects and then by learning the historical aspects, it, it wizens you up to recognize if you're seeing certain patterns. When you begin to see these patterns again, you say, that's just like such and such. And you might be, you know, perceiving what's going on in the matrix, so to speak. Now, the Egyptians... Right, where they had embittered the Israelites' lives of hard service. Now, when it says the Egyptians, we should not think that these were not obviously the same sort of Egyptians who, in that sense, welcomed Abraham. Right, it was not the same sort of Egyptians who had um, welcomed Joseph. Yes, they had a certain form of indentureship or slavery. But Joseph was able to rise to a very high level that his own Israelite brethren did not recognize or know that it was he. So it's like Moses, too, was able to blend amongst them. So we see certain racial similarities. So we have to say that the differences was not always racially in that sense, but the differences were also religiously. See, you, you see what I'm saying? That though we look at Egypt like Osiris, Isis, everybody worshiped that way, a more diligent study of it was, will tell you that it's like if you look at America, the art and fact of America, and you was interpreting, you see Mickey Mouse here, you see Jesus there, would you say, okay, they worship Mickey Mouse and Jesus for their God, and you see these other characters from other kind of popular fiction, you know, and you might put it together like that's because you, you, you don't know the right, the right composure of it. So look at our culture today or the present world culture today. And if this was destroyed and somebody was looking through like ruins and were finding bits and pieces of different things, how would they reconstruct what this particular culture was? I'm sure they will make certain great errors if they just go on a um, 
you know, like a, 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 a priori or just, just deal with it from an ignorance of really being able to construct the culture as it was in its own time. I, I, I hope you, you're getting me on that because these are, these are other aspects that ways of looking at it that have not been looked at before so much. So it's like there's a certain view of it that when you look at it that way and then you read the Bible, you say it doesn't really make sense, and then it feels like this can't be true because it's being misinterpreted, the cultural and religious context, as well as the racial context. And a lot of these Hollywood movies have done more to damage that. So it puts another layer of um, deflection. You know what I mean? It gives another layer of deflection. It's deflecting you from what you should be really looking at. You understand because something doesn't feel right, it doesn't sense, it's, and, and then you find that it's purposely done that way to be deceptive. You know, those things are kind of turnoffs on that level. It's not just a, a ignorant mistake. They know the Egyptians were black, and they also know that it wasn't like racially as they make it up in these Moses movies and other movies, but it was more how these religious archetypes were interpreted. It's like we say Jesus or Jesus or even Jesus, and others say Jesus or, or Jesus. You understand? They look at a, a blonde hair, blue eyed as the Savior, and, and, and the white, every, everybody right is white. You understand? We do not see it that way. You understand? They have a Bible or even the same Bible, but how they view it from that false racial archetype, it also perverts the interpretation the true interpretation of it. So it creates a kind of a, um, a twilight zone, so to speak, an altered reality on that level. But now coming out of that, 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 that spirituality, religious Babylon, and getting to the truth, these Egyptians who embitter their lives with hard service and brick and mortar and in the field, we have to understand that even in America, your people who are ruling in America right now, who are not two or three generation Americans, some of them are just one generation American, some of them are second generation American, and they've rose to the highest levels of office, and they are considered American. So if you were to read the record about them, and don't get all the background, because even when they read certain records of ancient Egypt, they're not always able to get a lot of background on an individual, where they were from, who their mama was, or whatever like that. It's not always the case. So they may read somebody's name and say, oh, this person was an Egyptian. And they were, was, but you don't know what their background was. And this is where the big confusion about the Egyptians who ruled at this particular time, or who embittered, the Israelites' lives, or even about the taskmasters. That's also a very interesting aspect right there. You know, like how they use um, certain racial or ethnic types in certain positions here. It's like in New York City. It's like you look at the police department, and it's like a lot of Irish that kind of went in that, like when you look at the Catholic Church, it seemed to be like a lot of Italians. You understand, and that, and and some key foundational um, offices and, and roles in society, certain ethnic groups did it. It's like at one time when they talk about laundry mat, it was Chinamen, like on the Chinamen laundry. You see, so in Egypt there was also that fragmentation of the population. Now during the time of Yosef, Ayusef. And and just after that time, the, the Beta Israel, similar to black people recently, were able to get a lot of bling bling and, and that to advance, you know, both on the square and off the square, both by doing legal activities and some even some illegal activities, but black people were able to, and we've been seeing that, you know, where if a black man is driving a car, a new car, he must be a drug dealer, you know, even when black people would think those sort of things. So when we look at the Israelites at this time, how the Israelites were prospering, 
let us also recognize that racial, the, uh, um, a kind of a, a not racial but ethnic dimension to it. So you you would ask, well, if they look like Egyptians, you understand? Then not look like Egyptians, but they were black peoples too. How they signal sing, sing, signal signal out because they had certain cultural differences, but they were also considered to be a part of the Israelites were considered to be Egyptians, but they were considered to be, you know how they'll say, um, such and such American. They were such and such Egyptian. You understand? And you had now those who were in the in the um governmental positions, certain certain cliques were in the governmental position, including certain um um Edomites. Some of the Edomites, some of the very Hyksos. People would think that the Hyksos were the Israelites, but the Hyksos wasn't really the Israelites, but the Israelites also could be go along with the Hyksos because they were brothers. But there also were differences between them. And remember, one of the prophecies was that the Edomites, you understand, would persecute, you understand, the Israelites. So there's also that dimension as well. And we didn't mean to get into that aspect, but I know it's, it's probably necessary for at least some of the island to get a clearer picture of this. But but it's a beautiful study. But these some of these studies to just get into these studies, you can learn a lot of things and get way 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 deep in the study. What we're trying to do is just lay a foundation. You understand for this Torah portion because it's these first chapters that really lay lay it out. And recently we touched on the Ehia Asha Ehia, I am that I am. And that's also in this portion too. So um if one gets up to that and want to get a little more clarity, check out the I am that I am. I think it's two or three vids that we posted about that as well. But anyway, at this point um Pharaoh had told the Hebrews midwives um uh, Sifra and Pua, that when they delivered a Hebrew woman, they were to kill the sons, but let the daughters live. And it's similar to, we just had a, a shooting of a black man uh, recently up here um, in New York, um, and they shot with deadly force to kill him, and we see kind of that same thing going on, you understand, even here, purposely directed against black people, even sterilization. They settled the case for sterilization, how they sterilize a lot of black folks with this eugenics thing. So we have overlays of this right here, but in particular against black people. You understand? Even Planned Parenthood. I mean, we get into that subject matter. Some of you might not know about it. Check out Planned Parenthood, the abortions, and certain things that are particularly de uh, directed against um, black people. And, and then black woman, you understand, considering abortion. And there's a big debate that they're trying to keep that underground concerning um, Planned Parenthood and the eugenics program and a similar kind of a thing here that Pharaoh did when they wanted to kill the Hebrew um, men, the black boys and males, but keep the daughters alive. That's that, A lot of that's been going on. Um, amongst black people here over the past 40 or so COINTEL pro years in this wilderness. So Exodus 1, 15 to 16 addresses that. Now, the midwives, they feared God. They were different than some of these ones and ones out there. They had a reverence for Jah. They understood what truth was about and that what they were being told to do for their job in exterminating black folks and their own people was wrong. So they feared God and they disobeyed Pharaoh. They disobeyed the government. You understand when the government had 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 a regulation. You understand that was uh, genocidal against black black boys. So they saved the baby black boys here instead of the Hebrew boys. Now Exodus one and seventeen. Now Pharaoh, like the government, then acts. You know that when when they tell you to do something, you don't do it. They ask the midwives why they had saved the boys. And the midwives told Pharaoh that the Hebrew women were more vigorous. They were more strong. They were more active, you understand, than the Egyptian woman and delivered before a midwife could get to them. 
Exodus chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. That's how, like, black folks were in in, in the days just before, like, um, civil rights. And as we go and look in black history, where it's like almost it seems like it was a different black folk. But a lot of that was socialized where we're at now, which is part of the bigger plan of what this template here in 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 Exodus chapter one is talking about. These are the afflictions and the tribulation and the bondage of the Beta Israel, the servitude in Egypt. You understand? Um so Ha Elohim, the true God, rewarded the midwives. They were rewarded because they reverenced Ha Elohim, and Ha Elohim made them houses. Exodus chapter 1, verses 20 to 21. Now, what's interesting about these two, notice this. This is where the, the Egyptic, the, the connection with Egypt becomes important, especially with our Ethiopic reconstruction, that when we look at this verse where it says that God made them houses, they just say that and they move on. They never explain what houses are. Look at houses in ancient Egypt. That's the whole Hathor, the, the Chidar. That's the Chidar connection right there in ancient Egypt, a dwelling place. But this is interesting, like, in what way would it have been, would it have been like a temple? Was it, was, was it a certain, even a goddess thing? But not in the worldly sense, but these are righteous women, are these sisterhoods? The, these two now had, had a sister. What does it mean that God made them houses? Hasn't been sufficiently explained elsewhere, but yeah, woman, we or others will also explain some more on that. But that's just a put a footnote there. Now, the Israelites, the Beit Israel, they continue to multiply, they continue to have youths. You know how they say that we have to reduce the population because we don't have resources because the evildoers, through a whole bunch of corrupt uh, um, means and even using the cloak of so-called law and, and order or disorder are stealing land and resources and are charging exorbitant prices that they make up in, in, the, in this make-up Babylonian system, this monopoly system. But the Israelites continued in spite of all of that, like black folks to a degree have also done, though these genocidal, abortion, Planned Parenthood, a lot of other things have, and, and, and the drug phase and and, and the bre breaking up of homes over false um, financial and economic and just a lot of disruptions that they have caused, you understand, in spiritual, psychological, and physical ways to I and I, just like the Israelites, the Beit Israel continued to multiply in Pharaoh. He charged all the people to cast every newborn boy into the river, leaving the girls alive, Exodus 1, 21 to 22. So it's almost like um, these two Hebrew midwives, like they had like a government almost job as midwives. Like, and this is all connected with the gynecology, women's health, so forth and so on, right? And when they did not do as Pharaoh or the government dictated, he got rid of them and he, he, he had alternative organizations, you understand, to do this. This is what we see happening uh, with black people in Planned Parenthood, and I hate to say it, but ones like the, the White House or the, the Martin Farrell and Obama's government is going along with these things too, whether it's for re-election or whether ones really believe in these things. You understand? It's the same sort of um, stopping the rise of the black messiah and these genocidal policies that collectively is a part of our affliction as the once lost but found Beit Israel in this spiritual Egypt. So we see that um, that kill the black man, keep the black woman kind of thing dynamic going on as well. And there's a lot of examples of that going on even amongst us and, and, and creating this that, that slick woolly lynchism, I think, is the best name for that. Because once you understand where that's coming from, that gives you all the details there. So um, now a Levite, a Levite couple, there was a Levite couple that was of a particular tribe, Levi. They had a baby boy, and the woman hid him three months. Now this is beginning Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. 
when she could no longer hide him, she made an ark of bulrushes. And the word there is similar to the word in, in, in the Ethiopic, like the tabot or the tebet, when we look at the Hebrew. She daubed it with slime and pitch and put the boy inside and laid it in a river. Now, they, they say in river, but here in our clarification and from an Ethiopic reconstruction, in the hape, you understand, or in the Gion, the Egyptian extension of the Gion, which is the Hape, or the Nile River, Exodus 2 and 3. As his sister watched, Pharaoh's uh, daughter came to bathe in the river. She saw the ark, the tabot, and sent her handmaid to fetch it, Exodus 2, 4 to 5. She opened it, saw the crying baby, the crying boy, and had compassion on him, recognizing that he was one of the Hebrew children, Exodus 2 and 6. Now, this is interesting right here, because um, there has been a, um, a reasoning that we've checked out um, that basically seeks to connect uh, Hatshepsut with this particular Pharaoh's daughter. Hatshepsut, Queen Hatshepsut. And from our follow-up studies of that particular link right there, there is a lot of, that is highly plausible. I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of, of, that solves a lot of the historical context of this and, and the scriptural context of this and even put some of the, the, the nameless other characters here into better um, perspective. Now, there's a very logical reason why these names wasn't mentioned, not to hide the individuals so much, but because of what their names signified from the uh, Egyptian, uh, what, what those names signified from, the, from Moses', um, how can you say, from his uh, renaissance. Moses had like a religious renaissance because what he basically did was not make up a new religion, but he went back to an older, to the older form that was lost in this latter or new Egypt. He went back like to the old time religion, you understand, of Abraham and the ancestors, but having to modify it because the experience of the people, you understand, now was more cosmopolitan. You understand? While before it was more rural. So this is where the law and other kind of regulations come in. And ones have to say, well, you could do that there, but you can't do that here. So these kind of regulations were put in, put in effect. So his sister, which is Miriam, she asked Pharaoh's daughter, and we'll put right here Hatshepsut. And we're going to go into a little more of why we say that um, a likely candidate of Pharaoh's daughter is Queen Hatshepsut. Whether she should call a nurse from the Hebrew woman and Pharaoh's daughter, Hatshepsut, agreed, Exodus 2 and 7. The girl called the child's mother, Yaakov, you understand? Pharaoh's daughter hired her to nurse the child for her, Exodus 2 verses 8 to 9. When the child grew, his mother brought him to Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son, calling him Muse, Bamarinya, that name is Muse. Now, Muse is a name, yes, but it's more over a title. When we go back to the Ethiopic and in, in, the, in the archaic Amarinya or Amharic, Musa means the head of a fraternal order. The name Musa means one who is the head of a fraternal order because she drew him out of the water because in the fraternal order, the baptism process, like the, in the, even among the Essenes and, and John the Baptist and the Israelite, the mikvah, the baptism process, is an important right of initiation, a right of, in a sense, passage. You understand? Know Going through these waters. You understand that? Like many rivers to cross, you know what I mean? Th that idea of crossing these rivers. Even with Abraham, he crossed a river. 
and he was acknowledged as Hebrew. He went through a certain rite of initiation, which we will call baptism. Exodus 2 and 10. When Moses grew up, he went to his brethren and saw their burdens. Exodus 2 11. She, he saw a, an Egyptian. Now, it's interesting. He doesn't name the Egyptian here either. And there's an interesting reason, possibility for that. But once we present our Ethiopic reconstruction of the, of the Hebrew Exodus, it will be much more clear now to see who was who. And when we look at the biblical story and, and understanding even the mythology, which what they call, quote, the mythology also tells a story in that, which is historical, but has been mythologicalized on that level. You understand? Um, it's like something happens to you and you write a lyric about it. You're telling what happened in the lyric, but one must interpret the song. He saw an Egyptian striking a Hebrew, a Hebre. And the Hebrews or Hebrews in Egypt, they were known as the Hebrews. The Hebrews were also a priestical or one can say a religious group, an ethnic but also a religious group, the Hebrews, right? The Hebrews. And, and this is going back to even in ancient Egypt, the more older or the archaic. So he looked this way and that, Moses. And when he saw no one, he struck the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Exodus 2, 11 to 12. Now, there is um, the tales of uh, Sinuhe. Sinuhe in ancient Egypt. When you read, I think it's Sinuhe that talks of the same thing, um, the same sort of story of one killing an Egyptian and hiding his body in the sand. And we'll try to like um, note that and bring that to the eye as well. But um, this is to give certain um, quick references that there's more data behind this. And y'all willing, y'all willing, we'll be able to bring it to you, you understand, and bring that forward. When Moses went out the next day, he came upon two Hebrew Hebrew men fighting. And when asked the wrongdoer why he struck his fellow, Exodus 2 and 13, the man asked Moses, Musa, who made him king? Who made him king? Now, that, that's, that's very interesting there. Lots in there. Asking him whether he intended to kill him as he did the Egyptian. So Musa realized that his deed was known, even though he hid the body in the sand, a, a form of a cover-up. Exodus um, 2 and 14, when Pharaoh heard, he sought to kill Musa, but Musa fled to Median, where he sat down by a well. Now, that's the end of the first portion. Now, he flees to Median, and that's going to be the next portion, and, and also the call of Moses, which we dealt with a couple of about maybe a week or so earlier. Um, we dealt with the I am that I am teaching, and there's a circumcision on the way, the meeting of the elders, and um, Moses before Pharaoh. So we're taking this in the various levels and aspects of it, but I think we need to focus here on the bondage and the affliction in Egypt and to further make the connection both with what happened to the Israelites and what historical time frame that was, because that provides us additional historical detail and clarity, even on Egyptology, from an Ethiopic reconstruction of it, of course. And it also helps us to see even today how we, as the lost sheep black folks, are still in a spiritual Egypt. And the connection with D.C., the nation's capital, as that symbolical Egypt and the going down to Egypt was, was, was manifested in the civil rights time and that march on Washington and the consciousness of the people in relation with Pharaoh, the Negroes and the White House or and Pharaoh or the federal government. You understand? Um, and there's a lot of correspondences that can be seen there. Now, with that in mind, 
also look at the aspect of the Israelites um, multiplying and prospering. And then the jealousy of so-called the, the native or the other Egyptians, you understand, know who were not prospering the way those black folks were prospering. The other black folks, or in this level of America now being that spiritual Egypt, by extension of this, of this um, symbolic logic, we can see that as well, you understand, with um, regular so-called, what do they call that um, kind of America? Um, regular America, you know, and then black America, that dynamic there, you understand? And we can see a connection between the, um, the enmity to black folks in this time, who have prospered, even with Obama and the Obamas and others, you know, they look at these, you know, like black folks are kind of, on one level, kind of happy if another black person, they would like to prosper too, but that, that kind of is inspirational to them and motivational in a sense. But to certain other areas of, quote, spiritual Egypt or America and other so-called Americans, that is like, you know, they demonize that. You understand? And we know if they could, just like in this Torah portion here, they would try to take it back by any means necessary. But that's not the only game going on. There's the next one that's aimed at the population and is aimed at the birth rate. You understand? And we have a very present danger and threat with this so-called Planned Parenthood recognizing the origin with with Margaret Sanger's and what's the eugenics and, 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 and to kind of exterminate or keep the black population in control, COINTELPRO, stop the rise of the black messiah, then in killing the males and keeping the girl children alive. Look at the incarceration rate as well. So all of those are, are, are real overlaying archetypes that we see only manifesting. You understand? amongst black folks in this time. And these are also prophetic. If we go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 to 20, verses 15 to uh, 68, we can see it all laid out again for us there in symbolic logic in verbal hieroglyphs. Then when we look at the real picture, what's really going on, you understand, with so-called black America, you understand? And black people in the West, especially with the Lord Sheep of the House of Israel, it should become very much more clear. So we are going to um, resume this teaching, but we're just going to, as we say, pause for the cause, brothers and sisters. You know, moderation, you know, is the key because just, just us even communicating this, and as we're communicating and thinking about what we're saying, we need to meditate on this ourselves because it's very interesting how we can look at that scripture. And what we did was just go over the overview from our new, from our new book right here. Our new, this was a like compilation right here. You understand? Compilation right here. You know, this is like a study, you know, a study volume, you know, because there's a lot of interesting things there that, that help to add certain clarity.